Genesis 18, verses 1 to 15, which is on page 17. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favour in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sears of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. <laughs> I'll just pray for John. Oh, please. thank you, please. Um, Father, um, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for these wonderful pictures that we have in the Bible. Um, Father, I ask you to be with us as we um, hear your word preached this afternoon, and um, bless John as he brings it to our ears. Amen. Amen. It's just a lovely little snapshot, that. It's not where we're going to be spending our time in our sermon, but before we move to the New Testament, it's... You know, Sarah and Abraham are both commended to us at different times in the New Testament. And you see here, um, they're operating as a couple. They're not perfect, you know. It's a little bit of doubt that the Lord would give the son and Sarah's lying. But they are working as a team. And they're working as a team actually in hosting the Lord. This is astonishing. You know, uh, Sarah goes off and starts cooking. Abraham actually goes out to do the shopping, doesn't he? To get the calf in. So they're, they're both working to be hospitable. Maybe a nudge at the beginning of hospitality week. But they are a team together. And that's the backdrop for where we've got to at 1 Peter. So do turn to 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. Kids, uh, do make sure you've got a Bible there as well. It's really important, and especially important, actually, I think, this week, that we've got Bibles open, because it's a passage that in some ways feels a little bit controversial when we were first read it. But I've been struck preparing it, how, as always... What seems at first perhaps a little controversial ends up displaying such wisdom uh, and help for us. Before we get into it though, can anyone remember the phrase we've often used to describe how the Christian has to sometimes resist uh, the ways of the world around us? Uh, it's this phrase, uh, only dead fish go with the flow. It's a really helpful phrase to have in your head. I come back to this again and again. Only dead fish go with the flow. In other words, if we're dead to the Lord, we're just going to get swept down river, aren't we, with all the currents of our culture. But as Christians, who have been made alive, as we've heard about, by the Holy Spirit, actually, we swim against the currents of our culture uh, as we swim in the ways of Christ. Uh, and if you're not a Christian, the reason we as Christians do that, that at times we, we are set apart from the way the world's thinking, is because we're convinced that the God who's made us has made truth known to us. And because he knows us better than we know ourselves, that truth is good for us. We're convinced that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God in person. 
but that his words are spirit and life to us. And we've experienced them as good and beautifying to us. But the fact is, because we're creatures of our culture, even when we know that, sometimes we find our instincts are, are tending to go downstream with the current rather than with Christ. And that means that when we come to the Bible at times and we face Christ's teaching, it can jar a little, and we have to do some hard work to understand what's really been said. And today's passage is a little bit like that. I wanted to mention it before we read it, but also to say that if it leaves you with questions, that just means I haven't explained it well enough, but do come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, almost everyone here, I think, knows me, so you know that all we try and do at Grace Church is try and unpack the Bible as best we can and see what God's Word means for us. So that's what we're going to try and do together. We've got to chapter 3, verse 1. We've actually been told already that in hostile times, when governments can be something uh, that they might, something rather than perfect, citizens are to submit to government. We then saw last time that slaves are a vulnerable category and their masters might treat them badly, but the slaves must still do good by submitting to their masters. And so as we come to chapter 3, verse 1, we come to another vulnerable group, very vulnerable in the ancient world, to wives who might be actually in tricky marriages. Let's read from chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives. When they see the purity and the reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outer adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves, they submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. That's our first reading. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Okay, let's spend some time thinking about this stuff, which is good for us. Well, we need to remember context always when we re read something. And I've mentioned it already. We saw last week that this whole section of 1 Peter is covering situations where Christians might face hardship for their faith. And if you look at verse 1, it tells us this situation is about how a Christian wife should respond especially when tensions come with a non-Christian husband. Can you see that? She's to act in such a way that might win him over to the gospel. Now, quick pause here before we even move on. I'm going to be addressing Salt kids uh, quite a lot today. Sometimes in Salt, we're always talking about why if you're going to go out with someone, you want to make sure that they're, they're not just saying they're a Christian, they're a true Christian. Uh, and the reason is because if we're a committed Christian, we want to marry someone who is a committed Christian as well. And we need to recognise and be reminded sometimes why that is. The first reason is because actually, if you're with someone who's not a believer, they can lead you away from the Lord in consuming your time uh, and wanting you to get involved with stuff that might not be pleasing to him. But a second reason is because quite simply being married to a non-Christian is often, not always, but often harder. Because you've got different values and therefore you're going to conflict in different ways. It might be that they resent your time at church. It might be they don't like the way that you're teaching the children the faith. And of course that can have an impact on your kids eternally, can't it? So there is wisdom about why we say, look, don't go out with someone unless you're getting to be serious, make sure they're a true Christian and that you marry only a true Christian. Of course, sometimes we find ourselves in marriages where that's not the case and we are to commit to those. But here, in chapter 3, verse 1, is that kind of context that we're dealing with. 
Wives particularly whose husbands don't yet believe. Now Peter doesn't give us detail about how to work out a difficult marriage in that context, but he does give us a principle, doesn't he? And it's one of godly submission. And you can see in verse 1 why that really matters if you look down. It is that so her husband might gain admission to heaven through her godly submission on earth. So that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives. Now, the point is that, you know, in a difficult context, pleasing Jesus is still the priority. Promoting Jesus is still the priority. By her refusal to argue, her readiness to do good despite not being treated well, he might still be won over. And if you look back to chapter 2, verse 12, that's been the theme all the way from there, hasn't it? That all of us, wives, husbands, boys, girls, all of us, we are to live such good lives amongst those pagans, non-Christians, that though they might accuse us of doing wrong, they might see our good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. That's the concern for Peter here. We've talked about fish swimming up river. Think of yourself as a salmon. It's not very, you know, flattering. <laughs> All right? Until you understand what a salmon's like. Salmons are super strong fish. Uh, they're super strong fish because they have to go up those fast Scottish rivers and they cannot just go up the rivers. But have you seen them jump the waterfalls? And they're doing that because their whole purpose is get to the top to lay their eggs at the very place that they were born. Lovely idea, isn't it? That where you receive life, you give life. So they swim against the current to get there in order to do that. That's a great illustration of Christian life, isn't it? We swim against the currents of our culture. Why? So that in the same way we, we were given spiritual birth through the gospel, we might actually commend that to others so they might receive that spiritual birth by coming to faith as well. Now here it's about wives, of course, but it's the same for all of us, isn't it? How we are amongst those who don't yet believe could be the difference between one eternal destination and the other, couldn't it? Well, when it comes to this submission thing, we do need to think carefully. Let's make a number of points from it. First, we need to understand that what Peter is commending is not something that's going to make wives subject to abuse. We looked at this last week, so we're going to go quickly, but... The Bible does commend where uh, abuse is going on, getting state authorities involved if you can. So if you are in a relationship, and it's still possible even in church that's going on, in which you or your children are suffering physical harm or undergoing wider abuse, it is important that you come and talk to us as elders. And we will walk with you if you're a woman. Talk to us or talk to one of our wives. And uh, we will help you to get appropriate authorities involved. This isn't anything that should justify abuse. There is nothing godly about just bearing with it when someone is treating you appallingly. But second, it is about tolerating hardship. Because we've seen that, haven't we, with citizens and the state, with slaves and masters, and here with wives, another vulnerable group. The fact is that all marriages are hard at times, and it's probably those everyday tensions that Peter is touching on here. And when things are especially hard, because they love you, your friends may encourage you to just leave the marriage. I've seen it again and again in pastorate. I understand why they might say that. But that's not the way of Christ. In fact, our whole society assumes that the purpose of life is to find personal fulfilment. So when your marriage isn't fulfilling you, it's very easy living in our culture for your instincts to be, well, the right thing is to leave this and to find someone who will fulfill me in my life. But the New Testament is clear. Remember that marriage vow? For better, for worse. We're committed to each other, come what may, because that Christian love is a whole extra level of love, of commitment, of grace, of forgiveness. When I did weddings, I would often say the vows are not for the wedding day. You know, the wedding day is a Disney perfect day, isn't it? It's all easy then. The vows are when the stress comes and the tension follows. And we can't say at that point, well, I said I will, but actually I won't. Every day you get up and you say, no, I will. 
And for Christ's sake, I will. So it is to tolerate hardship. Thirdly, and this has been a real revelation to me this week, it is to be like Christ. If you look at verse 1 carefully, can you see it says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. So what is it looking back to? Well, it's looking back to the previous section, which is all about the example of Jesus, isn't it? Have a look, at, for example, at chapter 2, verse 23. When they held their insults at Christ, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Now, given this submission thing is about being Christ-like, Peter can't mean that it's okay to do that if your spouse is asking you to sin. Christ never sinned. But he is saying it's right to submit even when being sinned against. To submit in the sense of still seeking to do good without sinning. Just as Christ submitted to Pilate. Now, don't get me wrong here. At such times we can respectively and should respectively challenge the person that's doing us wrong. But what we're learning here is that if things continue, rather than rage against them, which always actually makes it worse, the way of Christ is to submit to them, knowing that God sees it, and he will call them to account when the time is right. You know, the Christian life sometimes is not an easy thing to live in, but when it's not easy, it's still to do the right thing, isn't it? To please Christ and to commend the gospel to others. And the point here is that this kind of Christ-like submission is a noble and a beautiful Thing. I don't think it's hard to see this. I mean, just picture in your mind's eye. I mean, I can picture someone uh, who uh, displays this kind of mindset as a Christian. Just think about uh, the inner strength, the patient understanding, the sacrificial love, the unconditional grace of a long-suffering wife with a difficult husband. That is a beautiful and that's a noble thing, isn't it? It's not to be a doormat. Show incredible strength and resilience. And we're learning here it is to be like Jesus. The manifestation of God's glory here on earth, polished, if you like, to brilliance by the rough cloth of difficult relationships. So if you are in a difficult marriage, and I know, you know, in church life, all our marriages struggle at different times. You're persevering, it's not the point where you need to get others involved, but it's hard to be encouraged from this passage. You are being like the Lord Jesus Christ, and God sees it. And uh, just look from verse 3 onwards about the beauty uh, of this. So verse 3, your beauty should not come from outer adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past lived. Now, Peter is not saying a gentle and quiet spirit is a woman thing. I once read it that way. I just presume that as I read through. This is a particular quality for women. But actually, if you look at the fact that we're looking back to verse 23, it's not a woman thing. It's a Christ thing, isn't it? Christ displayed that gentle and quiet spirit as he faced up to Pilate. So we're being taught here because wives are the vulnerable category. That's how the wife should be with her difficult husband. But men, we're not exempt from this either. We should have a gentle and quiet spirit too when we face conflict. And it's not to say that we as Christians should all be retiring introverts. It's to say that we should not be argumentative, quarrelsome and overbearing. So husbands and wives, kids, everyone... When tension comes in our different relationships, the question is, is this beauty on display? The beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. In marriage, is this the beauty you are working in yourself to please Christ and do good to your spouse? I have to say, the Bible's not against outer adornment. Uh, Abraham famously gives um, Rebecca uh, uh, a nose ring um, and bracelets when she's um, 
uh, committed to marry his son Isaac. Abigail, David's wife, is talked about as being beautiful and intelligent. Now, the point here is that those things shouldn't be our focus. The point here is that they are only external, they fade. The beauty that really matters, well, what is it? Verse 4, it's the unfading beauty of that gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight, more worth than all gold that you might adorn yourself with. So a quick word to the kids, and I know this applies to us adults as well. Slightly gender specific, I know, that just, just allow that and that we can acknowledge that there always goes a step out. But girls, how much time do you spend adorning yourself? All right? Do you have your regime? 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 an hour, anyone over an hour, don't have to admit to it. But you have your regime to beautify yourself. Boys, I know the gym is everything at the moment. I go to the gym as well. I know, God, we do. It's not just the boys, is it? But how much time do you want to spend in the gym, you know, to bulk up? Are you, you know, working out your different programs? You've got your list of foods to eat, your protein extras, and how you're going to then... I can't remember what the other word is when you slim down. I don't know what it is. But you put a lot of effort into it so that you look as beautiful as you can be. Well, I think we need to hear the challenge, don't we, of verses 3 and 4. Do you put at least that effort into developing the inner beauty of a godly nature, of a gentle and quiet spirit? It's a serious question, isn't it? That's what matters. Everything else is going to fade. Trust me, I know, I'm 54. But that lasts forever. That is valuable in God's sight. That is being commended to us. So this godly submission is not to allow abuse, it is to tolerate hardship, it is to be like Christ. But fourthly, we have to acknowledge here it is the particular calling of wives. So yes, we are all to despair to some degree, but there is something particular about it when it comes to the wife with her husband. If you look at <laughs> verse 5, that, that's where it takes us, doesn't it? It's not just something for that particular time and place, it's something commended by actually Sarah, who lived 2,000 years before this was written, because it is the way things should be in a marriage. The Bible's teaching is that every marriage is to be like a little picture of our glorious gospel. The beauty of Christ's relationship with his church. Just think about that for a moment. Christ and we the church delight in each other, don't we? We love each other, we cherish each other, we find each other beautiful. And we are a team with Christ aren't we? To do good in the world as he enables us and to bring about spiritual children as we do the work of evangelism. And can you see in the same way then husbands and wives are to delight in each other, cherish each other, love each other and they are to be a team in the same way, to do good out in the world and to raise spiritual children, godly children who would know the Lord if we are able to to have them. But in every team, members have different roles, don't they? And so in this, husbands in the scriptures are called to act particularly like Christ, which means that they are to oversee their families and like the Lord Jesus who went to his death on the cross, sacrifice themselves for the good of their wives so their wives would flourish and so that their wives can then focus on their particular calling, which of course, if they're able, is to have children and in those early years particularly, to pour themselves out for them. To enable their wives to be able to get on with their responsibilities without having to think about all the other stuff. Because their husband has got it. And in that, therefore, there is that need for the wife to willingly defer to her husband's will as she gets on with what she does, as the church does to Christ. Now look, this is quite countercultural, isn't it? We need to say it's not a license for micromanaging and controlling wives. There's no place in Christian marriage for that, because that's not how Jesus is with us, is it? We have incredible freedom to go about our lives, but we do that, always conscious of what Christ's will is and seeking to please him in that. And it's to be like that in marriage. As wives get on with their life, they do it in line with what they've agreed with their husband, who and oversees the family for good. It is countercultural, this stuff. But can I say, 
It is good for our marriages, and it keeps us from the conflict of always buying uh, to, to sort of take charge. It keeps us all in marriage serving. Wives pouring their lives out for their children, particularly when they're young, because husbands are pouring their lives out for their wives, and Christ is pouring his, out, his life out for all of those, you see. It's all other-centred. But here's the thing. The Christian is to fulfil their role in that rightly, even if their spouse isn't fulfilling theirs. And that goes both ways. So if husbands, if a wife has been difficult, we've still got to pour our lives out for her to do her good. But here the issue is wives who are vulnerable with difficult husbands. And they're encouraged to keep on with this godly submission to their oversight. I know I overquote C.S. Lewis. Everyone gets at me for that every now and again. You're quite welcome to get at me for that. Uh, he's a quotable guy. He wrote a wonderful essay. If you've never read it, it's, if there was one essay to read by C.S. Lewis, it would be The Weight of Glory. And in that essay, he's talking about um, trying to see other people, you know, the people out there on the field and each other, through the eyes of Christ, seeing ordinary, everyday people as the immortal beings that they actually are when you think about being made in the image of God and destined for eternity. And he writes this, he says, all day long we are in some degree helping each other towards one or other eternal destinies, you know, to heaven or hell. And it's in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. I know, kids, you might have a little marble idea in that when we talk, start talking about immortals and eternals, but that's the reality, isn't it? And if you're married to someone who's not yet a Christian, they are an immortal being, aren't they? And how you interact with them could be the difference between one destiny or the other. That's how it is with everyone. Kids, those who are alongside at school, those sitting in our streets. And so whether wife or husband, if married to a non-Christian, see them in that way. Act like the salmon, swimming hard up river so that new birth might come in the very place that you found birth, as the gospel is commended. Well, if you have questions on that, do talk to me at the end. And if you feel provoked by that, you've probably misunderstood what I'm saying. I hope you can see that it's a good thing. Wives, then, are to display this Christ-like submission to their husbands, and especially when it's hard. But husbands, there is a word, a strong word, actually, here for us. Boys, make sure you've got a Bible in front of you, because I'm going to be addressing you a little bit in the next few moments. Have a look at verse 7. Husbands... In the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. number of things here. First, be considerate towards your wives. If you look at verse 7, that word of being considerate, it's, a, it's about understanding them. Husbands, do hear this. There is a command here, wives, you can remind us of this, to understand our wives. All right? Let's not make a joke about that. We're commanded here to be considerate, to have an understanding of them, of their needs, and to act accordingly, to know what your wife finds hard, to know what makes her anxious, to know what she struggles with, and to live in a way that is sympathetic to her. Because remember, we are tasked to pour our lives out like Christ did to the cross for the good of our wives. But there's one particular thing here to note that I'm going to be unashamed in naming because I think our culture sort of papers over it and that actually leaves the relationship between the genders worse off than better. Uh, and it's there and it's uncomfortable because we're creatures of our culture but to acknowledge that our wives are generally physically weaker than we are. Like men, women are called to be spiritually strong and courageous. Peter can't be talking about that. They're to be like Christ. 
But actually the word translated partner here, weaker partner, is actually weaker vessel. So it implies body weakness. Now this shouldn't be controversial, should it? Obviously, if you take it in a very generalised way, men are usually bigger and certainly stronger than women are. But the thing in context here is that it's important to think of uh, in how we relate to one another, particularly in terms of times of tension within marriage. And this is why I think it's so important to name this and understand this for what it is. First, guys, let's realise that we have a greater capacity for physical activity than our wives. And if you like to rejoice in being strong, you've been given that in order to serve your wife and the women around you. Up until the Industrial Revolution, I think this was quite obvious, wasn't it? The work men did was physical work to provide for their families. But even in our technological age, it's still an important one. You know, when children are young, I mean, I went to see Gina this week. You know, she's sleeping, she's eating, she's feeding, she's sleeping, she's eating, she's feeding, she's looking exhausted. No offense, Gina, if you're online. <laughs> Beautiful, but exhausted. <laughs> So isn't it wise and good that God has said, men, you've got strength. And there are going to be times when your wife is exhausted because of her, her particular calling to have children. And your strength is to serve her and care for her, particularly at those times. But it's not just that, is it? Because God has made women, uh, particularly in the perfect creation, to be able to have children, it means that for one week in four, that's pretty much a quarter of their adult life, it's quite possible that women are going to experience a weakness through the loss of blood that's bound up with periods. Later in life, the physical impact of having had kids, going through the menopause. So our husbands, we are commanded in verse 7 to understand that our wife is the physically weaker partner and to use our strength for her good, you see? <coughs> to serve her with it. Now, there's only one qualifier I want to mention. It is just something I've noticed over the years, which is the godly husbands who get this. I think sometimes, and can I just address you, if you're you know, sincere in this stuff, you get this stuff, let's be cautious that we're not overprotective. So I think it can veer to where we're sort of so monocolored with our wives that we almost patronise them and even stifle them. Let's not do that. Let's talk about it with our wives, about what their needs are, and recognise they've got physical strength as well, and that they don't need us always there. But for now, let's just note how enlightened the scriptures are here. Only now, 2024, are companies starting to talk a little bit about the struggles of having a period and going through the menopause. That's quite a new thing, isn't it? So suddenly we're starting to catch up with what 2,000 years ago the Bible was saying, understand your, your wife is a weaker partner in this, and, and, and use your strength to serve her. Peter, dignifying women in the spirit by urging us men to use our strength for their good. And it's interesting as well in verse 7 that the word translated wives there is actually different from verse 1. And so many commentators think Peter's talking about women in the household more generally. In other words, Peter is urging husbands to be considerate not just to their wives but to their daughters and perhaps female servants that were around as well. So boys, boys, Joel, that's you. Others look at me for a moment. There is a word in verse 7 about how you treat the sisters and how you treat your mum. Okay? There are times when they're going to be physically weaker than you. Are you the one that steps up to look after? I, it's really hard preaching this stuff because I've got my family in the room. Right? <laughs> I, I fail at this all the time, but I've still got to preach it to you guys and I've got to preach it to myself. But verse 7 is a word to us all, to you boys. Use your strength, not to put your sisters down, but to care for them. Use your strength. It might be easier for you to help your mum than it might be for your sisters, simply because you're a bit stronger. It will be easier for you to put the baby seat in the car, to pick up the hoover. Just it makes a difference. But second, we have to consider this as well. We may have a greater capacity for physical activity, but also for physical intimidation. No doubt that's there as well, given the context of tension in marriage. I still remember a talk, which I, it was such a throwaway comment, but uh, it was that 
Did men realise that if they're arguing with women, there is almost always immediately an asymmetry because we're bigger and stronger? You know, Bethan is a foot shorter than me, which her, you know, the rest of the family love to point out to her. But that means if we are having an argument, and you know, it's happened on rare occasions, um, <laughs> simply my standing in front of her is intimidating physically, isn't it? And often men, we don't let things go, do we? We push them forward, are they being louder? just because I'm a man. We need to be aware of that, don't we, if we're to be considerate of our wives in their so-called physical weakness compared to us. So I need to be self-aware, to talk not chat, perhaps even to sit rather than stand, to be very aware as well of how my emotions can get physical as a guy. This was brought home to me when I first ever did a ministry in a church, because I was given a toddler group. And I went into this toddler group, and I was told, what we do is we put all the, all the uh, toys in the middle of the room, okay, and all the kids come in and they start playing with the toys. So I thought, okay, ready, all right? 20, 30, under threes, let's go for it. Girls all came in, picked up a toy, sat down, started playing with it like this. Boys came here, picked up a toy, smashed it on the floor, smashed it on other people's toys. A few of them started to cry as other toys were smashed up. There was just a difference from the beginning. But let's be aware that that resides in us even as adults, doesn't it? If ever there was a condemnation of domestic violence, it is verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 3. Well, look, if all this is what it means to live in an understanding way with women in our home. What is the motivation? Well, the motivation is this one, that with us they are co-heirs of eternal life, heirs with you of the gracious gift. That, the language there could mean they're potential heirs if they haven't yet come to faith, or that they are believers and so they are heirs. But it's an astonishing way to talk about women in the first century. Peter is affirming equality between men and women before God, equally his children, equally inheritors, equally heirs, equally loved, infinitely loved. So boys, another word for you. Look at me, taps, oh, got you all with me, looking around, it's good. So last few years, there's been quite a lot of uh, influence on lads growing up as teenagers of bad male role models. So the Andrew Tate is the sort of pinnacle of that of a terrible model of what it is to be masculine. I know that you know this is nonsense, but do not believe it for a moment. True manhood, yeah, it can be about being strong, but it is using your strength to serve and care for women particularly, okay? If you wanna be a masculine man, that's what it looks like, because it's to be male and it is to be like Jesus, all right? So don't take that stuff for a moment. Recognise, particularly, that your sisters, your mum, they are co-heirs with you of eternal life, which means that your God loves them infinitely. He gave his son to die so that they might be his. So how is he going to feel about it if you are treating women badly? He's not going to be happy. Not least because he is a God who always stands with the most vulnerable. And in the relationship between men and women, usually the woman is the most vulnerable one. And if you look very carefully down at verse 7, if you treat women badly, there is an implication, isn't there? Can you see it? Treat them as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Why? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. So that nothing will hinder your prayers. In other words, if you do not treat women well, that may be bring you under God's discipline. But he won't listen to you when you're praying. Here, the, the husband was someone who should have been holding his household up before the Lord in prayer. And his prayers aren't going to be heard if he's a hypocrite because he's holding his household up in prayer at one point and he's treating his household badly in another. Men, boys, if you're praying and praying for something for your family and God's not answering it or for something else, ask yourself, am I being a hypocrite and actually how I treat my family? Boys, how you treat your mum and your sisters, it may be God is holding back because of the sin that you're committing towards those that he loves so tenderly. So the only way ahead for us then is one of repentance, isn't it? To seek God's forgiveness, to seek his help to change so that we might be 
men who own that same beautiful inner. The gentle, the quiet spirit of verse 4. That's what we are to seek to foster, isn't it? Only dead fish go with the flow. So we're to swim against the current of our culture. Wives displaying that godly submission rather than an argumentative hostility when tension comes with husband. And men by standing apart from the toxic masculinity of our day. Often so esteemed, showing our strength in gentle understanding, serving of the women God has placed around us. And boys, sometimes that means you're standing up to your friends who might think it's a cool thing to emulate Andrew Tate to speak badly against girls that are at school or in some other way. You show your manhood by standing against them, by displaying something different. And even if that brings hostility to you, that's the way of Christ, isn't it? Well, let's have a moment, shall we? A, a chance for prayer, a chance for you to pray that home for yourself, bring it to the Lord, to ask him to help. I'm very aware that this might touch on some quite difficult situations. That is, do come and talk to us about those, but do bring it to the Lord who understands that situation that you're in. A moment for prayer before we move on. Father, we thank you that your word forces us to think about things that perhaps uh, the world outside isn't willing to think about. Thank you, Father, that it forces us uh, to really unpack situations and what it is to be like Christ within them. But Father, even as we hear it, we're convicted and we, we bring before you our many sins and failings in our different relationships, whether as husbands or wives, boys, girls, whatever it might be. Father, forgive us where we have not been like Christ. Thank you that he died to pay the penalty for, for that failure. Thank you that he rose to fill us with his life, his spirit, so that we might learn to live his way. Father, for each of us, would you give us that strength of character that can display that quiet and gentle spirit, particularly when hostility comes that is concerned for the good of the other and uses any strength we have to serve. And we ask it all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.